All right. Well, welcome everyone to our history hour for February 2023. And tonight our guest is Dr. Joshua Smith, who is currently the director of the American Merchant Marine Museum in New York. He's here to discuss his new book, Making Maine, The Statehood and the War of 1812. And this is something that um, he created drawing on archival materials from the United States, Britain, and Canada. And he's exposed the bitter experience of Maine's citizens of, during the War of 1812 as they endured multiple hardships, such as overtaxation, starvation, smuggling, treason, and enemy occupation. And this is a book that he, he wrote with the support of the Border Historical Society in Eastport. And as we know, Sullivan and Hancock County, as well as Washington County are part of the borderlands. And we can hear from Dr. Smith about Paul Dudley Sargent and his involvement uh, during this time period, as well as many other exciting tidbits. So um, without further ado, I'd like to induce, introduce Dr. Joshua Smith. Well, uh, and thank you, Toby, and thank thank you for providing all the publicity for this and organizing this event. I'm uh, uh, always very excited to get back to Maine. I'm, I can't claim to be a Maine native, but uh, it's really where my heart is, and I, I love talking to local historical societies. Um, and I do have to thank again the, the Border Historical Society, which helped underwrite the expenses of publishing the book. It's, it's called a subvention, if, if, if you want to know, um, and, and provided a lot of moral support. Um, and, um, you know, it took, by the way, 30 years to write this book. I, I, it started when I was a student at Maine Maritime Academy in the mm, very early 90s. <clears throat> and I, you know, stumping around Castine, you can't help but but notice all these ruins from the War of 1812, and it really got my imagination going. And here I am 30 years later, uh, about 20 pounds heavier and 30 years older and, um, and a lot grayer, um, but I've, I've produced this book. Um, it's really started out as a book purely about Maine and the War of 1812, and then it sort of slid into the, the statehood issue and during this 30 years, I kept on running into this character, Paul Dudley Sargent of Sullivan. And um, he's a very interesting guy. I probably have a very different take on him than you all do, but he's a very interesting fellow. So what, what I'm going to do tonight is first I'm going to talk about the book in, in general and the, and the War of 1812 that played out in Maine. and then. I'm going to go into Paul Dudley Sargent's role in the War of 1812, which, which is really pretty interesting. I, I probably should have played it up a little bit more uh, in the book, if, if anything. So, um, so okay, so let's start talking about the book in general. And, and why Maine, besides the fact that I really like Maine? Um, well, it, what I found is that Maine is is an interesting area to study in the time of the early republic because it is torn with tensions and it is this battleground between the commonwealth of massachusetts of which maine is the eastern counties uh, and the federal government and it sort of taps into some really important strands of american history that we continue to wrestle with today, like, is this um, one nation indivisible, as, as we all used to say every morning at, at school uh, back in the day? Um, or is it a union of individual states um, that can individually declare actions of the federal government unconstitutional and therefore void? Or, and here's the kicker, since it's this voluntary association of states, can they leave whenever they want? Um, and Maine is really a battleground in this struggle between 
the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is very impressed with itself, um, and this infantile, weak federal government, which is just struggling to get its feet underneath it. So um, it's important stuff. And um, I think it's it's worth a look at that level. Plus, I'm, I'm dredging up a, a lot of history that um, I think sometimes got buried on purpose. The War of 1812 in Maine is a very unpleasant experience. And people are very unhappy. There's a lot of neighbors shouting at neighbors and threatening violence and riots and tumults and, and all sorts of other uh, events, including enemy occupation, plagues, spies, smugglers, uh, 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 all sorts of things going on. So how was I able to pick this apart, my methodology, if you will? Um, the answer is, uh, I'm very interested in the actions of ordinary people. Uh, I'm not looking at high political thought so much. How do ordinary farmers, fishermen, sailors, others respond to this changing dynamic in the early republic? And, uh, and, and what does that all mean? And how I get to that, a lot of it is through federal records in the National Archives or in the National Archives in Kew in England or uh, Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa. Uh, but I think probably the most interesting sources I used were Maine's court records, both county court records, uh, which are in Augusta usually, uh, or federal court records, which are down in Waltham, Massachusetts. And there's a lot of interesting stuff in that. So let's start out with the, the background and why Massachusetts is a problem in the early Republic. I'm going to speak at the Massachusetts Historical Society a month from tonight. And I, I think I'm going to get some quizzical expressions on the crowd's face when I say, you know, why is Massachusetts the problem? Um, and uh, but it, it's it's a strange state uh, in some ways. Uh, for example, it's virtually the only state that retains its colonial state capital, which is, of course, Boston, after the revolution remains in Boston. Now, if you think about New York, you know, Albany's the capital, Connecticut eventually becomes Hartford, uh, Rhode Island, it moves from Newport to, to Providence. Uh, New Hampshire moves out of Portsmouth, moves inland, and virtually every American state strives to have its state capital in the middle of the state because it's deemed to be more democratic. Well, why doesn't Massachusetts do that? Well, oddly enough, the answer is because of Maine. Um, Boston, if you include Maine as part of Massachusetts, Boston is the middle. Uh, although there are people in Massachusetts who want to uh, move the state capital to uh, horror, um, Worcester. <laughs> and um, of course, this is an idea that displeases the, uh, the great and the good in Boston. Uh, so uh, foremost among these Massachusetts people is a is a lawyer who used to practice in Maine on occasion, a guy named John Adams, who will become the second president of the United States. And he's sort of an anomaly in the early republic in that he is he's unbelievably proud of Massachusetts. And he will tell anybody who will listen, including princes and kings in Europe, that Massachusetts is the most superior society in the world, bar none, because of town meetings, the congregational church, um, the fact that there is a respect for law and order and education, and that for Adams, this is sort of the ideal state. And, and it makes people from Massachusetts a little odd. I mean, there are provincial people everywhere, but Massachusetts is really hung up on its superiority. Um, and it means that, in a way, 
the populace of Massachusetts is not very interested in being American. Uh, and even Henry Adams, who's the, I think, the, the great grandson of John Adams, writes that, you know, Boston is not a very American city, even in the 19th century, that they sort of consider themselves a people apart. And other founders, George Washington is certainly critical of Massachusetts Yankees during the Revolution, or uh, another Virginian, Thomas Jefferson, writes that Massachusetts really would be great if it did not think itself the whole. And, and, and what he's saying there is that Massachusetts assumes it speaks for, for the rest of the country. And, and of course, this is simply not true. Um, and, uh, uh, and people, many people in Maine uh, wanted to break away from Massachusetts. So, so we certainly know that people in Maine very often are not buying into what I call the Massachusetts ideal, which is based on uh, the Commonwealth's uh, constitu state constitution of 1780, which is put together by John Adams, essentially, which has some unusual features like uh, a very strong executive. It has a much stronger governor than other states. Uh, it calls for a state religion, which is the congregational church. Uh, and uh, it uh, uh, demands religious conformity, um, which is a problem, but it is supposed to provide, you know, this stability. And uh, there is this ideal where in Massachusetts, people are supposed to respect their superiors. And where do those superiors come from? Well, usually Boston. <laughs> and it's uh, Harvard graduates. Um, the, uh, as, as they used to say, the great and the good in Boston, uh, not only expect, but demand your respect. And this is known as deference. And the problem with all this stuff and with Massachusetts having this elevated sense of itself is that when the federal government does something it doesn't like, Massachusetts threatens to secede. And this becomes a regular political event in the first couple decades of the 19th century. And of course, is, is going to lead to Massachusetts threatening to secede at the end of the War of 1812, along with sister New England states and form, you know, a, a separate country potentially. And this almost develops into a civil war in Maine not old Massachusetts so much, but in Maine. Why Maine? Because Maine is where a lot of people do not believe in this Massachusetts ideal. They believe in the ideas of Thomas Jefferson and not so much the ideas of John Adams. Um, and Maine is a young, dynamic, growing place and an enormously disorderly place as well. There are a lot of what they call tumults, um, but what we would probably refer to as riots. And part of these riots frequently are, are political struggles between uh, the two parties of the day who are the Federalists and the people in Boston are Federalists who are sort of elitists uh, and want a deferential society controlled by the elite. Um, versus the Jeffersonians, often called Republicans, who believe more in the common man. And, and unfortunately, we'd have to say common man because not many people are talking about women's rights yet. So uh, nor rights for anybody, but really what white men. Um, this um, spills over into religious issues. It's spills over into issues between um, Maine settlers, many of whom settle in the woods without a proper deed. They are squatters, in fact, um, and they resist Massachusetts state authority, which is trying to eject them. And that's covered in another book, a, a brilliant book by Alan Taylor called Liberty Men and Great Proprietors that came out in the 90s. Uh, and that happens inland, but on the coast, you get a different dynamic where um, smugglers are defying federal authority uh, and uh, 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 fighting 
customs officers. And notably that the inland squatter struggles end up in, in the murder of exactly one man uh, outside of Augusta and the smuggler struggles in basically the same year end up in the murder of exactly one man on Isle of Ho. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a testy place. There's a lot of tension. Um, and the conventional politics get quite ugly too between the Jeffersonians and the Federalists um, where we get this idea of the, the gerrymander. It's a Massachusetts term from Essex County where one party tried to you know, create a congressional district in such a way as to guarantee a safe state. Well, guess what? Maine is part of Massachusetts at that time. And that happens here where you get uh, office holders being dismissed en masse because they don't have the right politics. Um, uh, again, a lot of unhappiness. And then just to uh, make it a super unhappy place, uh, in 1812, the United States Congress declares war on the British Empire. And uh, in this war, Jeffersonians will support the federal government and they support a war uh, against the British, whereas the Federalists will oppose the war quite bitterly, um, often to the point of treason. Um, in Maine, uh, this is quite interesting because Maine is the Jeffersonian part of Massachusetts. So virtually all of the soldiers that Massachusetts sends to the War of 1812 come from the District of Maine, actually, uh, a much higher percentage than in old Massachusetts. Uh, and um, the Federalist opposition, though, is pretty fierce. And a lot of this comes from the pulpit from Congregationalist clergy who try to reprise their role that they had in the American Revolution where congregational clergy were really, you know, getting Americans to fight for independence and, and really getting their parishioners out there. Um, but in the War of 1812, it's very different. For starters, um, the, this congregational clergy opposes the war uh, and they're trying to undermine it, but they don't have nearly the power they used to before. Uh, and there are other issues that, that annoy people, like high taxes. The, the tax burden in Maine uh, increases by about 600% with federal taxes to support the war. And um, Federalists and Congregationalists uh, are saying it's immoral to pay these taxes. So some people are trying to refuse to pay taxes. And there are, in fact, what we could call tax revolts in the District of Maine. Um, there is a British blockade right off the coast of Maine. So our shipping can't move without getting captured. And this causes not only misery to ship owners and sailors, it actually causes starvation because we know that places like Sullivan uh, can't feed themselves. They need to bring in food such as flour, especially from uh, the rest of the United States uh, and people in Maine begin starving to death. And we know that is true in Hancock County. We've got uh, congregational ministers writing about families that starve to death. Um, a lawyer in Ellsworth is writing about families starving to death. Um, so this war brings misery, famine, uh, starvation, uh, disease uh, is prevalent. And then of course, the, one of the most horrifying aspects of the war is in 1814, Eastern Maine, including you know basically all of Hancock County and certainly all of Washington County is occupied by the British. And uh, on September 1st of 1814, a British fleet captures Castine. Uh, two days later, on September 3rd, 1814, the uh, local militia is uh, not just defeated, but it's routed from the battlefield in Hamden up on the Penobscot River which is very embarrassing. And Bangor ends up getting sacked, plundered, uh, as does Hamden. Uh, and then on September 11th, the last outpost east of the Penobscot falls to British forces. And that is the fort at Machias. And you've got this very interesting situation that we don't see much in American history where 
American citizens are under enemy occupation. And it is enormously demoralizing to the people. Nobody knows what to do. Can they vote anymore in American elections? Do they pay taxes? Do they uh, cooperate with the British? Which, which, by the way, most Federalists argue, yes, cooperate with the British, including the sheriffs of both Hancock and Washington County are notable collaborators. And then there's this issue of a neutrality oath where the British garrison commander in Castine demands that everybody east of the Penobscot swear an oath, not of loyalty to the British, but to remain neutral, to not take up arms against the British, basically to defang them, to, to, to promise that they will uh, not cause trouble for the British. And then there is a lot of trade with the enemy in Castine, uh, which you can call smuggling if you want. And uh, so an intensely unhappy period in Eastern Maine. But I would argue that the most interesting letter of the occupation actually comes from Sullivan. And it's a letter written by Paul Dudley Sargent, who is one of Sullivan's selectmen in 1814. And he writes a letter to a fellow named Samuel Dana in Old Massachusetts, um, saying that, you know, hey, we, we've just received this notification from the, the British general in Castine demanding an, an oath of neutrality. And Sargent says, you know, I can't abide it. And actually, I am going to remove myself from the occupied zone. And he says he's going to move to Hamden for the duration of the British occupation of Eastern Maine. Um, we don't know if he actually does that, by the way, but that's, that's certainly what he said. Uh, he also says uh, that he would like to take command of an American military force, say 3,000 men, to attack Castine. Um, and he thinks it, it could be done if they had some artillery uh, and they could make Castine, as he says, and I quote here, too hot for a Briton or a British soldier to breathe in. Um, and at the same time, he is expressing his contempt, really, for Federalists, like the, the governor of Massachusetts, a, a lawyer named Caleb Strong, uh, for his neighbor from Gouldsboro, a guy named David Cobb, who'd been the lieutenant governor of Massachusetts at one time, and what he calls their sycophants. So he's really disgusted by the Republicans. Of course, Dud Dudley had been a colonel in the American Revolution and, and, and was a real patriot, um, but uh, which is admirable, right? I, I, I think we can say that's good, but... Um, it doesn't make him necessarily a pleasant man, as, as, as we'll see. So um, Sargent continues his letter. It starts on, on the 4th of November, 1814, and then he continues the letter on November 10th. And he recounts that he, as the select, one of the selectmen of Sullivan, went to Castine and he had a discussion with the British general there, Major General Gerard Goslin. Uh, and Goslin says, well, you know, you're under martial law and that he expects the Sullivan selectmen to make everybody in Sullivan take this oath of neutrality uh, and um, Basically, Sullivan says no, that that uh, um, that would, in effect, be treason. Um, and then Sergeant asks Goslin if a person could leave the occupied territory uh, by water. And, and Goslin's completely taken aback by, by this response and, he, uh, uh, and asked if uh, Sergeant thought that people in Sullivan wanted to leave the occupied zone. Um, and they have this long conversation, um, but uh, it, it's pretty admirable 
that, that sergeant has this conversation. He's speaking truth to power, as they say. Uh, and, and he isn't backing down. He's an old Revolutionary War veteran, and he's seen the British off once, and he's convinced he wants to do it again. And by the way, before he leaves Castine after this conversation, he takes a good long look at the harbor and the fortifications and reports that, in his opinion, yeah, this place could be taken by an American force if we if we really wanted to. So in, in sum, I think your local boy, Paul Dudley Sargent, uh, your selectman, uh, demonstrates a, a good amount of what could be called moxie in confronting this British commander. But who, who is this guy, Sargent? Um, and I, I think I've got a different view from, from you all uh, in Sullivan. Um, and I, I certainly have a, a different view from the, the sort of pamphlet that was produced about him 100 years ago by an ancestor, a Winthrop Sargent, who wrote this book called Colonel Paul Dudley Sargent, uh, which is really an exercise in filiopietism, right? This is a sort of ancestor worship. And uh, in a sense, I think it would be unreasonable for us to expect a, a really honest take on uh, his ancestor, Paul Dudley Sargent. So I'm, I'm going to break the rest of the talk down into, into two parts. I'm going to talk about um, the defining element of Paul Dudley Sargent's uh, adult life in Sullivan, which probably some of you will sympathize with, uh, which is his poverty. <laughs> He's broke and in, deeply in debt his entire adult life. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about his politics. So um, Paul Dudley Sargent's poverty comes about after he leaves the Continental Army in 1777. He moves to Boston. He gets involved in shipping and in the perilous practice of privateering, which is outfitting a, a commercial ship with cannons, getting a license from the government and setting forth and seizing enemy commercial ships. And I don't know if it's from his trading ventures or from his privateering, but um, things go sideways. They do not go well. And not only does he end up broke, he ends up deep in debt and he will not succeed in breaking free from that debt in his lifetime. And he's he will never have enough money. And it it bothers him because he's from quite a wealthy and very interesting family of uh, uh, you know politicians and artists and authors. Uh, you know the Sargent family were a pretty big deal in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So, um, but he's broke, and his response to this is to move to Sullivan, uh, which makes it you know a lot harder for his debtors to uh, catch up with him. And when he's in Sullivan, he he does basically everything he can to piece together a living to make money. Um, he holds multiple offices, and you know some don't pay, like being a a selectman. But he's the local postmaster. Um, he's a Hancock County judge of probate. Um, he's a justice of the peace. He operates a ferry in Sullivan. So he's trying to piece together a, a living that sort of befits what he regards as his status. And uh, he's doing interesting things like uh, in 1797, he writes a letter to President John Adams and he's saying, hey, um, we have this new thing called the United States Navy. Uh, uh, and Sullivan would make an excellent naval base. Uh, and in 1807, he's even asking for a, a military detachment to be stationed in Sullivan. So, uh, and all of which, of course, would would help local people make money. Uh, in his early years in Sullivan, he is a merchant and a ship owner, um, and he is involved in some pretty dodgy maritime trade which we can call smuggling. Well, um, well, what do we mean by that? Well, 
He sends ships to the West Indies, that is the Caribbean, um, to trade with the British islands down there, which have you know, lovely things like rum and molasses and, and other products that uh, folks in Maine really want. And in turn, those people on those sugar islands down there really want Sullivan's timber. They want lumber uh, of, of any sort. Um, but it's illegal to do this. So what Sullivan, uh, what Sargent does is he equips his ships with two sets of papers. Um, he goes to St. John, New Brunswick, and he gets a British set of papers for his ships, but he also has an American set of papers that is produced locally uh, in Maine uh, by American officials. And, uh, this, and depending on who his ship gets boarded by, he produces one set of papers for the others. Well, how do we know this? Well, we know this because he gets caught by a British naval officer in Barbados. And the British naval officer boards the ship. He can sense that it's a, a Yankee ship, that it should not be trading in Barbados, which is a British colony. And he doesn't believe the British papers. And eventually he presses the, the master of the vessel, confesses and produces a second set of American papers. And so here's what this uh, naval officer writes about the schooner, which is the schooner Brilliant. Uh, and uh, this naval officer writes that the schooner Brilliant belonged to Boston, owned by Paul Sargent, and that she received her British papers at Mount Desert. So I think that's a 100% connection with Paul Dudley Sargent, although he misspells Sargent, but he's a naval officer. Oh, by the way, you might want to know the name of this naval officer who's writing about Paul Dudley Sargent. Uh, is, this is a Royal Navy, I think, lieutenant at the time. Uh, and the name of this naval officer is Horatio Nelson. Does this ring a bell with anybody? If anybody's ever been to London, there's a statue of Horatio Nelson on a plinth that's like 80 feet tall in the middle of Trafalgar Square. This is this, this officer will become Britain's most famous naval officer ever. <laughs> Nelson, who dies at the Battle of Trafalgar, his greatest victory. Uh, and here he is encountering a, a, a schooner belonging to Paul Dudley Sargent of Sullivan. And uh, in fact, N Nelson has a very hard time with this ship. Um, the, the Barbados courts won't have anything to do with this. They want the ship to trade with them and they're pulling all sorts of tricks. So Nelson actually carves into the mast of, of this schooner um, what's called the King's Broad Arrow. And this is a symbol that the ship has been seized by, by the Royal Navy. Uh, and it is a way to recognize that ship if it should get away from him. And in fact, he does fear that a mob will take over the schooner and take it away from him. So he ends up taking it to another island called Nevis uh, in the Caribbean. Um, and, and he does get it successfully prosecuted, but he doesn't get any of the proceeds. The, the, uh, the governor of Nevis, the royal governor of Nevis, uh, ends up claiming all the proceeds. So Nelson doesn't get any money out of the schooner and presumably neither does Paul Dudley Sargent as well. Um, and the, the smuggling shenanigans don't end there with Sargent. He, um, uh, uh, one of his many daughters marries a son of Nathan Jones of Gouldsboro, um, whom customs officials think is a smuggler. So he is doing anything he can to repair his fortunes. Um, and part of that is he, he has this very fraught relationship with the local customs collector, uh, Melatiah Jordan of Ellsworth. And the problem is, is that Sargent thinks he should have Jordan's job, uh, especially since Jordan is an ardent Federalist and Sargent is actually a Jeffersonian or, or Republican. 
Uh, and he wants, uh, and he writes a bunch of poison pen letters uh, aiming to displace Jordan and get the job for himself. Uh, this includes letters to Thomas Jefferson, uh, and you know, to whom he, he sort of disingenuously writes, and I quote here, it's not from any prejudice I have to Mr. Jordan or from a wish to supplant him, but from a duty incumbent on me as a magistrate and holding an office under the general government, although should it be thought advisable to remove him, I should accept the office. Okay, you know, can, can you smell it? This guy, uh, he's denying that he wants the office, but he's saying he'd take it if it was offered, right? So it's, it's, it's not completely honest. And he and uh, Jordan really do not get along, that they have frequent rows. And, and he also, at the same time he's doing this, he's fishing to be the customs collector at either Penobscot to replace a Federalist there. He almost gets the collectorship at Machias, but somehow at the last moment, that opportunity is yanked out of his hands. Um, so he never gets these sort of lucrative federal jobs that would give him the, the, the cash and status he craves. Um, and, uh, you know, he's still there in Sullivan after the War of 1812, but in 1818, he gets a pension from the government for his service in the revolution. Uh, but to his horror, his enemies write to Washington and say, this guy has too much money. He doesn't deserve a pension and the pension is withdrawn from him. And this is devastating. He's, he's now a very old man, uh, and he, he really needs this pension. And he starts writing to anybody who'll listen to try and recover this pension. So, um, and he's got some business problems too. Uh, he'd been running a ferry for decades, but apparently a new bridge is built in Sullivan in 1820. And so that ferry business, which brought him up to $400 a year, is gone because of that bridge. Uh, and he also includes an inventory of everything in his house in his pension application, which is available online through the National Archives website. Uh, it's quite an interesting inventory in which he uh, includes his house, which he, he describes as follows, I quote, an old house tumbling about my head and no means of repairing it. Um, now, I think we have to be careful when looking at his protests about poverty, because remember, he's trying to prove to the federal government that he's poor and therefore should get a pension. It, it sort of reminds me of, of me <laughs> this year applying for financial aid for my daughter to go to college. You know, I, I would like to appear poorer than I am. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I think we have to take this with a grain of salt, although his house does not survive is my understanding. So I think he, he may be accurate in that regard. So here again, I think poverty is the, is the defining feature of his life in Sullivan. Now, politics is, is the other element, and he's sort of unusual in Hancock County in that uh, he's the only maybe the only, but certainly one of very few Republican or Jeffersonian judges in the county. Everybody else is a Federalist. Castine is a Federalist town. Ellsworth is a Federalist town. Blue Hill is a Federalist town. Bucksport is a Federalist town. Hancock County is very Federalist. And um, they give him a, a lot of grief for his politics, and he, he complains about it in letters uh, to Washington. Uh, and he never felt that his loyalty to Jefferson and his ideas was ever rewarded sufficiently. You know, he didn't get these great offices that were going to repair his fortune. So I, I think the other question we have to address when we talk about Sargent's politics is, did he favor statehood? He, as far as I know, he doesn't leave any record regarding statehood. What I can say is that Sullivan, 
as a community is divided about statehood until 1819 when it comes around as does most of the district of maine they people figure out that we need to get rid of massachusetts at this point uh and there are only 30 voters in sullivan uh or at least 30 people who voted in sullivan in 1820 uh, 1819 rather uh for statehood uh because you have to be uh, a male over 21 property owner probably white there's a little wiggle room there but probably white uh and uh in 1819 sullivan will vote in favor of statehood 29 to 1. boy wouldn't i like to know who that one person was undoubtedly a federalist i think and i i suspect not sergeant because jeffersonians tended to favor statehood while federalists uh did not so um, by this time, he's elderly and failing health, um, doesn't seem to have engaged with statehood, did not get uh, offices in the new state of Maine uh, or employment, um, and, and he's elderly and ill. So um, that's my take on uh, Sullivan and Paul Dudley Sargent in the War of 1812. And, you know, I, I hope you'll read the book you don't have to buy it you, you know hopefully your local library has it uh, it's called making maine um if you go to the university of massachusetts press website and university of massachusetts press is who published the book uh, you can use the code mas068 and you'll get a 30 percent discount on the book uh, and uh uh that you just need to enter the code when, when you purchase the book on their website. Um, and uh, But again, I'm not saying you have to buy the book, but uh, I'd be delighted if you went, supported your public library and took a copy out because I think there's a lot of interesting things in there for, for Mainers to discover about the, the place where they love and where they live. Uh, and on that note, uh, Toby, I, I think, I'm done with the formal presentation. I'd be delighted to take questions about anything I've said. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, we are open to any questions from anyone about uh, anything to do with Sullivan, anything uh, down East Maine during this time period. You can raise your hand or speak up in the unmute yourself or you can type into the chat. I wanted to um, ask a little something when you mentioned the um, starvation. Yeah. Um, that was an issue and it seems like that continued into um, 1814 when well past that but uh, Congress in April of 1814 ended the embargo but the Royal Navy continued to uh, pillage the or plunder the coastal trade um, yeah that's right and so how long how long were they still hanging out I know in Eastport they remained around for several more years as far as the rest of Washington County and Hancock County were they still very much a presence? They they show up in September of 1814 and they leave at the end of April 1815. Uh, and uh, the, the problem then during the occupation is that the British will pay in silver coin for food. And um, locals are probably buying their provisions on credit. And the British are paying a premium price. So food is flooding into Castine, but poor people can't afford to compete with the British. So it's pretty bad. But probably the year before actually was bad, before the, 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 the British occupation, when uh, uh, Congress declared this embargo, no coastal trade, and British ships were also attacking our ships. And uh, uh, it, uh, 
you just couldn't buy flour. And even this uh, lawyer in Ellsworth, who's a, a wealthy man, he's saying, I can't buy food for my family. And he's reporting that local families are hawking their you know, silver dishes or anything they have to buy food. Um, and uh, the pastor in Blue Hill is talking about a woman who starves to death with her two children. I suspect the husband was off fighting the war or something like that. And uh, so there, there are reports of, of deaths. So um, I think the Yankee of 200 years ago was, was a much skinnier critter <laughs> than the Yankees of 2023. 20, uh, and, you know, every, every spring was what they called the starving time in Maine, because your food starts to run out, and um, there's no way to replace it. Uh, and, and it was just difficult. So um, this actually had an impact on the war in that, it, well, Toby, you, you've got what teenage sons right and they probably like to eat right and um so so what parents started looking at their sons eating eating all the food out of the diminishing larder and saying hey son have you ever thought about joining the army because that way not only would you have one less hungry mouth in the household but uh you could probably also get his uh, a bounty was paid for every person who, who signed into the military. So it could probably help the family survive that starving period. So the, yeah, the military uses that starving time to advantage. Uh, and uh, don't tell your sons I said that. <laughs> <laughs> no taken. Um, yeah, so thing I don't see this. Uh, anyone else have any questions? Oh, I see. We do. Yeah, I understand, too, from some that I've read that uh, during that particular time, the war, that the settlers here, once the British ships started to come in, they said, oh, boy, that's it. They're going to come in here and take my chickens and take my cow and everything else. And I think they actually burned down some houses, too, or some barns after they took all the critters. The other thing that I heard was that the people, the, the same people, the local people, if they enlisted in the army, instead of being involved in a unit around here to protect people and so forth, they shipped them off to someplace like Vermont that didn't have the host line, and, and they didn't do much. They, they didn't they didn't see any warfare or anything they uh so people in this area again requested that Massachusetts send soldiers you know protect our farms and so forth and Massachusetts never did is that uh, that, 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 that that's absolutely right <laughs> Massachusetts refused to send aid to, to Maine uh, which, which, and and in fact, was negotiating. The, the governor of Massachusetts was negotiating with the British forces who were based in Halifax, Nova Scotia. That you know it, that if Massachusetts should secede from the nation, would the British provide arms? And the British give a sort of tentative yes. So. Um, you're absolutely right about about the the troops leaving and going to upstate New York or Vermont. Um, the war, the American military effort in the War of eighteen twelve is not very glorious for the army. It's a little better for the navy, uh, and people were concerned about that. The British weren't burning much stuff. Sometimes they did. Um, so the the basic deal was if you resisted when the British military showed up in your town, say in Hamden or Bangor uh, or Frankfort or, or Bucksport, if you resisted, um, they would tear the place apart. And they would not only eat your chickens and goats and cattle, they would also smash all your windows and burn your books and, and humiliate you in, in every way possible. But the other side is, is that if the British military showed up, 
and you immediately surrendered your arms and you cooperated with them, you would find they paid for everything with silver coins and silver coins were rare in Maine, not a lot of hard currency. And that ultimately the Yankees preferred their property over their patriotism. And certainly the people in Bucksport figured this out very quickly that if they cooperated, not only would they not be molested and their property not destroyed, but they could actually make a lot of money. Um, and, you know, I think we all understand there is that strand in Yankee culture that really likes money, <laughs> you know, a, a little too much, right? Uh, and so uh, Eastern Maine tends to knuckle under, and I think that the great exception to this is Paul Dudley Sargent, who goes there and blasts a British general, and he's not going to take their, their nonsense, and, and he is a, 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 a patriot, and probably a very difficult man to get along with as well. So uh, it's, it's kind, of, kind of my take on, on him. So good points. I, I, I think you're right. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jean. Anyone else have any questions or want to say anything? It's like a quiet February evening. It is. It's a it's a quiet crowd. No, no, no Massachusetts yeah. loyalists there who th think we should rejoin Massachusetts. So I, you won't see that much in Maine, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we've got some oh, Raina. She says, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. And again, I would like to, this is my copy. I know it's a mirror image. Um, Dr. Smith's book, Making Maine Statehood in the War of 1812. It just came out last November, 2022. And as he said, if you go on to the University of Massachusetts um, press site, you can enter the code, which I can put up on our page to anyone who's attended. The code is MASA068, and you'll get 30% off the book. And I highly recommend it. I've also purchased, I have several other books by Dr. Smith. Um, the smuggling in the borderland is, is a very fascinating topic as well. Highly recommend that or those of us with down east roots and um all right um any closing comments from anyone oops yeah mas068 yeah. okay now, now yeah. i got it it's my, yeah. my fault <laughs> no worries 30 percent. Uh, that's it you know again yankees and love, love their discounts right 30 yeah. percent. that's pretty good no, one it's, so. yeah. it's a very I good deal yeah. All right. So, yeah, um, I would like to thank Dr. Smith for his time tonight. Yeah, and yeah. just yeah. Uh, again, everyone, uh, my name is Toby Connor. I'm the communications coordinator here at the Sullivan Sorrento Historical Society. And um, this is our Zoom history hour. We will have Another one next month, March, with Sam Younger, who is in attendance here, I see. Um, and that will be on the Big Boss Mine in Sorrento. And it will be pretty, I think that'll be pretty intriguing because it's uh, got the um, murder and the mistress and all of that exciting drama. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Anyone wants to register for that, go on to our website, SullivanSorrentoHistory.org, or our Facebook page, and I'll put up the links to uh, Dr. Smith's book online for those interested in purchasing a copy. And all right. Well, thank you all very much for attending tonight. It's been a delight. Dr. Smith, it's been an honor to have you. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Toby. Thanks again for arranging this. All right. Uh, so good night, everyone, and we hope to see you next month. Thank you very much. Thank you.